Alright, here's a crash course in matrix assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight mass spectrometry and a look at what I'm doing for my research. So, here you go. Alright, so what is matrix assisted laser desorption ionization time of flight mass spectrometry? Well, quick and dirty is you have a plate. Plate fits into a machine. Plate has wells on it. Take a sample, you take the same sample, you run it in replicates into these wells. And what happens? Put the plate in the machine, it goes into a vacuum. So it's in almost a perfect vacuum. And on the surface of the plate, here's your sample. It's your sample consists of uh, for like intact cell mass spectrometry. The sample consists of whole cells, okay, and then they're surrounded by a matrix, or they're encased or crystallized into a matrix. And what happens is you shoot this with a laser, the laser transfers its energy into the analyte or the things that are on the outside of the cell, since this is an intact cell, they believe, we're not quite sure, we're not positively sure what's happening, but uh, they believe that the uh, there's things on the outside of your cell, uh, proteins, glycoproteins, um, proteins basically, that are being ionized or they're getting charges added to them, and then the laser obliterates or lifts these off, blasts them off, they come flying off. So here's an analyte with a positive charge attached to it. So 20 nanoseconds later, a coil surrounding this area energizes. And what that does is it takes the sample, which is now ionized, and flings it across a distance or a known distance into the detector. Okay, when it flies across the distance, uh, I believe it's QB equals one half MB squared, where 2QB equals MB squared. V we know as velocity equals distance over time. So that's why they call it time of flight, because when they know the distance, the question is, is how long did it take the analyte when it was obliterated to reach the detector? Uh, once you isolate, so it's AP over T squared, divide by M, divide by M, square root, and we've got distance over time, distance we know, find out the time, yada yada yada. So, anyway. All right, so what does this give us? This gives us an intensity. So it gives us mass charge, or MZ. And what that is, is that these analytes, what they found is when they shoot bacteria, what you get is a consistent fingerprint most of the time. They're very they're highly consistent, depending on how you're preparing the cells, which is part of what I'm looking at in my research. So. Uh, so the fingerprints, will, it'll be like a bunch of little noisy peeps, and then you'll have like a peep, and then another peep, and another peep, and another peep, like that. Something like that. Sometimes they're really close together, sometimes they're, sometimes they're really broad, which is really ugly data, some of them are really, really narrow and good. So, <clears throat> what is that? These fingerprints uh, are what enable us to, already they've shown very, very uh, regularly that you can tell um, species apart. So they can shoot E. coli and they can shoot staph epi, or they can shoot and distinctly tell them apart pretty much 100% of the time. So what I'm kind of looking at is, can we detect difference between and using this uh, this machine and 
the, we're in the early stages of doing that, but right now what I'm looking at is two different things. We're looking at culture conditions. And sample preparation. So the culture conditions are we're growing cells on triptic soy auger and we're growing cells in triptic soy broth. So solid versus liquid. Okay. The next thing I'm looking at is we're looking at sample preparation. So we've got that out of the way, we're looking at sample preparation. Sample preparation is what we're talking about, the intact cell aspect or the protein extraction. Intact cell just means, like I showed you before, where you have the sample and it's isolated. You have whole cells in the mix, right? Protein extraction is where we take cells and we'll have an Eppendorf tube where we spin them down and get a pellet. Into here, we're going to put formic acid and, and then you swish it around to kind of break the cells open and then you add the acetonitrile and then we take and vortex that really lightly and we'll centrifuge it again. So then you end up with some liquid this part we don't want, so what we'll do is we'll take this out, put it in yet another Eppendorf tube, and then use that to spot the plate. And then from there, there's your plate, there's our sample. Actually, with the protein extracted, it ends up being more like this, flat. And then what we'll do is we'll overlay that with the matrix. Laser hits it, the proteins that are in the sample, analytes, end up flying up, making the spectrum. Blah, blah, blah. All right. So, that's the gist of what I'm doing. Um, when I show the, the multidimensional scaling, which is a three dimensional representation, when you have spectra and they are very different. You end up with points that are very far away from each other. Because they're not very reproducible. So what that's dealing, what that's telling us is that when these spectra look very, very similar, you end up getting a tight clustering of those points. And that's just one way of looking at the data. So uh, that's, that's, one, that's one analysis. There's also uh, similarity matrices where the same similarity in, in, in spectra, if they're highly similar, then you get a dendrogram that shows you that you have 0% uh, all the way to 100%, and this would be 100% similarity. And the better the, the reproducibility, here would be 90 and at the very end would be 100. If you're above 95% up here, then it'll break off and two samples will end up being uh, very simple. Like uh, this would be spot A1 on the plate, this would be spot A2 on the plate. And if you were to shoot an A3, and A3 comes back being very different, then it would probably break off somewhere up here and end up at being A3 and that's just another way of looking at the data. So there's all kinds of different ways and then we do averages and standard deviations and we do something called spectrum quality where we take the base peak, 
So a base peak is something like to say that's that, that's that, get another one. Base peak is always the most intense peak. So what we're doing is we're, we're taking, we don't care so much where it's located or, or what mass the data point's at or how tall it is. What we want to know is how much taller is it compared to the noise or the stuff going on down here that doesn't meet the quota and how good the resolution is or how tall the peak is with respect to how wide it is at one half its height. So in a perfect world, uh, every analyte that comes off and becomes part of the fingerprint would come off and create a straight line because the analyte would be 0.6 or 6800.0215672 Daltons consistently. That means every analyte would come off being that. But not in the perfect, we're not in a perfect world and you get analytes that come off at 6879.1 and you get analytes that come off at 6881.2 you can just, you know, da 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 But if you got that, and they're coming off not in the same relative ratio as this, because then you would have one big broad peak, but you still get them flying off the majority, if 99% of them come off here in this line, and another, let's say 97%, and another 1.5% come off over here, and another 1.5% up over here well then you would get a peak that's a little wider so anyway so that's resolution the other one is called signal to noise and then for reproducibility or similarity we're looking at the ability for the spectra at 20 these are just made up numbers 2800 6800 and this might be 9600. If we get in the intensity, relative intensity, say that's our base peak, this one's that high, that one's that high. So the relative intensity, this would be 1 or 100%. This guy would have a relative intensity of uh, 80, and this guy was 75 or 70. Um, <coughs> if when you shoot the next sample, or when we move on this, the plate from here, if we move down here and shoot it again, and you get another with roughly the same relative intensities, then that would be very highly reproducible. With, this, with the same 2800, 68, 80, and 9600, then that would be really, really, really reproducible, and the dots on your multidimensional scaling would be very, very, very close to each other, if not right on top of each other. In a perfect world, they would all be one point, but they're not. So we shoot it 20 times, and we see how close or how much we can get those to stick together. Ultimately, that's what's going to lead to being able to distinguish MRSA from MISA, and I know a little bit about my research.